Hello, I'm Callum Burke and welcome to my video presentation on Nazi ideology, looking at its ecological element. First of all, I'll look at the role of background thinkers that predated the rise of the Nazis, leading to the formation of the blood and soil doctrine. I'll then go on to talk about the role of nature within Nazi ideology, leading on to ecological policy formation, and then I'll give my concluding thoughts at the end. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy my video. Over the last 20 years, research has been undertaken to understand the role of nature within Nazi ideology, mainly the existence of right-wing ecological ideology within the Nazi party. Nature and environmentalism have been prevalent features of German political thought before but predominantly after the Industrial Revolution, with increased urbanization and hyper-consumption driven by the spread of capitalism, anti-enlightenment, environmental romanticism began to rise to prominence. In order for us to identify the existence of the ecological movement within the Nazi ideology, we must first better understand the development going on in ecological thought within Germany predating the Nazis' rise. Two 19th century figures lay the basis of ecological thought within the Nazi ideology, and these were Eretz Moritz Arndt and later his student Wilhelm Heinrich Reil. Whilst best known in Germany for his fanatical nationalism, Ernst Arndt was also dedicated to the cause of the peasantry, which led him to concern for the welfare of the land itself. Historians of German environmentalism cite him as the earliest example of ecological thinking in its modern sense. His article in 1815 on the care of conservation of forests, written at the dawn of industrialization in Central Europe, rallied against the short-sighted exploitation of woods and soil, condemning the deforestation for its economic causes. Allen's environmentalism, however, was intrinsically bound up with xenophobic nationalism. His appeals for ecological sensitivity were always phrased in terms of the well-being of German soil and the German people, and his demands for racial purity against the French, Slavs and Jews marked every aspect of this thought. At the very outset of the 19th century, the deadly connotation between the love of the land and militant racist nationalism was firmly set in place. Raal, a student of Arndt, later developed upon the sinister tradition. In some respects, his green ecological streak went significantly deeper than Arndt's in his press for environmental activism. In 1853, his essay Field and Forest ended with a call for the fight for the rights of the wilderness, but even here a nationalist ethos was felt. He says, quote, We must save the forest, not only so our ovens do not become cold in winter, but also the pulse of life of the peoples continues to beat warm and joyfully, so that Germany remains German. Raoul strongly opposed industrialization and urbanization, and his overly anti-Semitic glorification of the rural peasant values and undifferentiated condemnation of the modernity established him as the founder of agrarian romanticism and anti-urbanism. Building upon these 19th century thinkers' ideas, Richard Darwin wrote Blood and Soil, and his work enabled him to become a prominent ideologue within the Nazi party. The unity of blood and soil must be restored, as was reclaimed by Richard Weir and Darwin in the 1930 book. The infamous phrase denoted a quasi-mythical connection between the blood, the race or folk, and the soil, the land and the natural environment, specific to Germanic peoples and absence, for example, among the Celts and Slavs. For blood and soil enthusiasts in the Nazi party, the Jews were especially were a rootless wandering people, incapable of any true relationship with the land. Non-German blood, in other words, endangered an exclusive claim to sacred German soil. While the term blood and soil had been circulating in Volkish circles since at least the Wallenheim era, it was Dara who first popularized it as a slogan and enshrined it as a guiding principle of Nazi thought. Hiring back to Arendt and Rahl, he envisioned a through-going ruralization of Germany and Europe, reviving the peasantry in order to ensure racial health and ecological sustainability. Dara was one of the chief race theorists and was instrumental in galvanizing peasant support for the Nazis as it was employed by Hitler in the early 1930s. However, within the Nazi party, blood and soil was not a fully subscribed to doctrine. The issue of blood and soil nearly split the Nazi party after 1925 and was only resolved at Bamberg Conference of 1926. 
One side of the party wanted to emphasize the relationship between true Aryans and rural life, as Hitler believed Germans became from the soil and had a family background based on farming life in the countryside. However, men like Grigor and Otto Strasser wanted the party to move away from the theory of blood and soil, more towards a publicity that attracted support in the urban areas. The Strasser brothers, however, were defeated on this issue, and Hitler rallied his supporters around blood and soil, while Otto Strasser left to form his own party, based outside of Germany. Gregard was eventually measured, murdered in the Night of the Long Knives. Having discussed environmentalist and ecologist thought within the Nazi ideology, I will now discuss the role of nature within the National Socialists. The religious status granted to nature by the Nazi party could be described as a volatile mix of nature mysticism, pseudo-scientific ecology and a rationalist anti-humanism and a mythology of racial salvation through a return to the land. Throughout the writings of Hitler and other Nazi ideologues, a fundamental understanding of human interaction with nature was understood. And this was in strict opposition to human efforts to master nature. It was understood that nature was not solely created for the purpose of man, but instead man was part of a link of a living chain within nature, just as any organism. Hitler himself was particularly fond of stressing the helplessness of mankind and the feature of nature's everlasting law. He echoes the environmentalists of the 19th century in Mein Kampf when he announces, When people attempt to rebel against the iron logic of nature, they come into conflict with the same principles to which they owe their existence as human beings. Their actions against nature must lead to their own downfall. In the many varieties of the Nazi worldview, Ecological themes were linked with traditional agrarian romanticism and hostility to urban civilization, all revolved around the idea of rootedness in nature. This was most pronounced among the neo-pagan elements of the Nazi leadership. Above all, Heinrich Himmler, Alfred Rosenberg and Walter Thayer. Rosenberg wrote in his colossal, The Myth of the 20th Century. Today we see the steady stream from the countryside to the city, deadly for the Volk. The city swell even larger, unnerving the bulk and destroying the needs of which bind humanity to nature. They attract adventurers and profiteers of all colours, thereby fostering racial chaos. It must be noted that for some elements of the Nazi party, these ideas were not merely rhetoric and reflected firmly held beliefs and practices at the top of the Nazi hierarchy. Hitler and Himmler were both strict vegetarians and were attracted to nature mysticism and homeopathic cures staunchly opposing vivisection and cruelty to animals. Himmler even established experimental organic farms to grow herbs for SS medicinal purposes. Additionally, Hitler often discussed in detail the various renewable energy sources possibly available to the Nazi party as alternative to coal, utilizing environmentally appropriate hydropower and producing national gas from biochemical sludge. He declared water, winds and tides as energies of the future and alternatives to coal and gas. Moving on from discussing the role of nature within the Nazi party, I will now discuss the implementation of ecological policy that Hitler and the Nazi party implemented after their takeover in 1933. It is frequently pointed out that agrarian and ecological moments in the Nazi ideology and policy were in constant tension and if not in direct contradiction to the technocratic industrial thrust of the Third Reich's rapid modernization. However, as early as March 1933, a wide array of environmentalist legislation had been approved and implemented at a national, regional and local level. These policies included reforestation programs, laws protecting animal and plant species, conservationist blocking of industrial development, marking the Nazi regime as undoubtedly the most progressive in ecological measures in the world at that time. Planning ordinances were also designed for the protection of wildlife habitats and that demanded respect for the German forests. The Nazi state also created some of the first nature preserves in all of Europe. In conclusion, I have discussed how the Nazi party's ecological element within its ideology was developed from long-held environmentalist thought in Germany in the century that preceded the Nazis' rise. It has also been shown that although division existed on the importance of ecological elements within the Nazi party practice, 
it still remained influential upon many of the themes of the Nazi ideology, from Leben Raum to scientific racism. Additionally, it has been shown that ecological rhetoric did transform into active policy after the Nazi parties ascended to power in 1933, with environmental laws passed and nature reserves created. However, it is also evidential that the pressure of the Nazi German war machine put most environmental policies on the back seat as they fell out of political discourse in favour of war mobilisation.